In this video, I'll teach you how to make a Django API using Python and the Django REST framework. The API will look something like this and we'll be able to create, read, update, and delete data. Now at the end of the video, I'll even show you how we deploy this API to a public URL. And if you want to test out the API that we'll be building, I'll leave a link in the description right now. If you click on that link, it's going to bring you to a platform called Acorn. Now I've teamed up with them for this video. This is a completely free platform. You can sign in with your GitHub account and what will happen is it will actually start running an instance of this API. Once it's finished running, you can click on this button right here and it will bring you to a deployed public version of it where you can actually test it out. So you can go to slash blog posts and this will be your own instance of the API. You can mess around with it. You can do whatever you want and you can test it out. So I'm going to show you exactly how we do that. So once the video is finished, you can deploy the API that we made. You can share it with people and you can use it from the internet, not just from localhost. With that said, let's get into the video. So to begin, we need to do a little bit of setup here and install the necessary packages. At this point, I'm going to assume that you have Python installed on your system. And what you'll do next is open up an editor, something like VS Code, and simply open a folder. In this case, I've opened a folder called API. It's important that we are working inside of a folder and that our terminal is in that location for the commands that I'm going to show you to run. Now what we'll do is we'll create a new file where we'll specify the requirements that we need for this project. So we're going to say requirements.txt and inside of here, we're going to write out Django, Django REST framework, and then we also want environs like that. Okay, so these are the three packages that we're going to need to install in order for us to work with Django. Now that we have these in the requirements.txt file, what we'll do is install them using the pip command. So from our terminal here in the same directory where we have our requirements.txt file, we're going to type pip3 install hyphen r requirements.txt. This will simply install all of the packages that are inside of this file. Now, if you're on Windows, you're going to change this command to simply be pip. If you're on Mac or Linux, it'll be pip3. So we're going to go ahead and hit enter and it should install all of these for us. Once that's installed, we have most of the basic setup done. And now what we need to do is create a new Django project. So now that we have our dependencies installed, we're going to use a command to create a new Django project. Now to do that, we're going to type Django dash admin start project. And then we're going to call this my site. You can call it whatever you want, but I recommend you go with the name my site. Now for some of you, this command will work for others. It will not. In my case, this command does not work. So the way that I fix this is I'm going to remove the admin and I'm going to type Python three dash M and then Django start project my site. So if you're on Mac, it's going to be Python three. If you're on Windows, it's simply going to be Python. Okay. So go ahead and run that. And we should see that we get a new directory being created here called my site. This is where we'll write our API and where we'll run the next commands. So we're going to change directories into my site. So now notice I'm inside of this directory in my terminal. From here, we're going to create a new app. Now inside of our projects, we have various apps. Apps are ways to separate out different pieces of logic. In this case, we're going to have a simple app. This will be for the API. So we always need at least one app. So we're going to create one called API. To do that, we're going to type Python three manage.py. Notice that's the file that's right here. And then we're going to say start app and we're going to give this a name. I'm going to go with API and I recommend you give it the same name. Go ahead and hit enter and you'll see a new directory is created here called API. Now what we need to do is we need to connect this app with our main Python project or our Django project, sorry. And the way we do that is we go into my site directory. We go into settings.py. Let's make this a little bit easier to see. And we go into where we see installed apps here and we add our application into the installed apps. To do that, we simply add a string and we give it the same name as the project name or the app name, sorry, which is API. So notice we created a new app called API and I've added that here to the installed apps. Now, as well as that, we're going to add the Django REST framework in here because this is something we'll use to have some nice clean views for our API. So we're going to say REST underscore framework inside of the installed apps. And for now, that's all we need to change inside of settings.py. Now that we have linked our API with our project, what we want to do is start building out the model or the data that our API is going to interact with. Now you can obviously have multiple data sources, in this case, multiple models, but we're going to start with a single model. What we're going to do is open the API folder. Inside of the API folder, we see that we have a file called models.py. Now this is where we define the different database models. 
Now Django uses something known as an ORM. Now an ORM is an object relational mapping. And what this does is it maps a Python object to a database instance. This is really nice because it allows us to use multiple types of databases and have Django handle all of the low level commands that actually create, update and retrieve data. And in our case, we can use a higher level Python wrapper, which is known as the ORM to access our data, create our data, et cetera. You'll see how easy Django makes it using the Django REST framework in just a second, but bear with me while we create our first database model. So we're gonna create a class here. This is how you do it in Django. And we're gonna say that this is blog post. Now this needs to inherit from the models.model. When we do that, we get all of the basic functionality of a database model, which in this case is really equivalent to a table in something like a SQL database. Now what we need to do is define all of the different columns that we have for our model or the fields or type of information, sorry, that it will store. So we're going to begin with a title and we're going to say that this is the models dot char field. And inside of the char field, we can specify a parameter, which is the maximum length equal to something like a hundred. Next, we're going to specify that for each of our blog posts, we'll have some content. This will be a models dot text field. Keep in mind, you can make this anything you want, but I'm just going with some basic fields here. And then we're going to have a published underscore date. And this is going to be equal to the models dot date time field. And we're going to add a parameter here called auto add now, which is equal to true, which specifies that we don't need to actually set what the time and date is whenever we create a new instance of this model. So we have a new row in our database. It's going to automatically kind of fill in the published date for us. Next, we're simply going to say define underscore underscore string underscore underscore. We're going to take in a self and we're going to return the self dot title of the model just so that if we end up printing out this model, we actually see some information about it. So that's really it for the model. You can get much more complicated here and store a lot of different types of data. You can have relationships, you can have multiple models, but for now we're going to do a very simple one. We're going to focus on the API views and then later on you can adjust the models and you can create multiple views for making different types of models. Now that we have our model, we need to create something known as a serializer. So I'm going to make a new file here and it's going to be called serializers.py. Now inside of here, what we're going to do is specify a class that will take this model and convert it into JSON compatible data. If you're unfamiliar with JSON, this is JavaScript object notation. And whenever we work with an API, we're essentially sending and receiving JSON data. It looks something very similar to a Python dictionary, but the idea is that we're going to have all of these Python objects that we'll be working with in our code, and these represent information in our database. We want to create what's known as a serializer that will take an instance of this Python object and convert it into something that we can actually return and interact with from our API. So it might seem a little bit uh, abstract right now, but bear with me, it will make sense. So we're going to say from the REST framework, import the serializer. We're then going to say from dot models import the blog post like so. Now we're going to go and create a class and we're going to call this the blog post serializer. And this is going to inherit from the serializers dot the model serializer. So a lot of this is already done for us. We just need to kind of hook up the different models. Now we're going to create something known as a meta class. So we're going to say class meta. We're going to say the model is equal to the blog post. And we're going to specify the fields that we would like to serialize and return when we use the serializer. Now the fields are going to be ID, title, content, and the published date. Now you don't have to do all of these, but if you don't include one of them, it's not actually going to be returned uh, in the API. Okay. So you need to make sure that any fields you want to be returned from your API, you specify in here. ID is a field that will automatically be added to all of our models. We don't need to specify that when we create the model. Okay. So we now have our serializer and we have our model. The next step is to create a view that actually utilizes the model and the serializer. So we're going to go inside of views.py and we're going to use some Django rest framework views. Now, the really nice thing about the Django REST framework is that it provides some default views for creating, updating, deleting, etc., and doing the standard operations that you would with a REST API, hence why we installed the Django REST framework. So what we're going to do here is import a few things from Django REST framework that give us something known as a generic view. And that's that nice view that you saw when I gave you that original demo at the beginning of the tutorial. So we're going to say from the REST framework, import generics like so. Now generics contains generic views that can be used to update, delete, etc. any type of model. 
So what we're going to do is create a simple view for now. And we're going to say class blog post list create is equal to the generics dot list create API view. And then inside of here, we just need to specify a few basic things. The first thing we need to do is specify the query set. Now the query set is going to be equal to blog post, which we're going to import in a second dot objects dot all. That means we now need to import blog posts. So we're going to say from dot models import the blog post. Now what we're doing here is we're just getting all of the different blog post objects that exist. This is how you do it using the ORM in Django, the object relational mapping. If you want to get all of them, you simply say the name of the model, which is what we specified here. Dot objects dot all gives you all of the instances of our blog post. Now that is our query set. And then beneath this, we specify the serializer that we want to use when we're actually returning this data. So we're going to say serializer underscore class is equal to, and then this is going to be the blog post serializer, which we also need to import. So we're going to say from dot serializers, import the blog post serializer. Now that's actually it. We've just created a view. We now need to connect it with a URL. But what this view will provide is a way for us to create a new blog post and to get all of the blog posts that exist. You can extend this and you can make it more complicated. But right now, just with what we have, once we add a URL for it, it will automatically allow us to create and then return all of the different blog post objects. That's what this generic API view does. There are a ton of other generic API views. You can look them up from the documentation and I'll show you one more after this. Now that we have the view though, what we need to do is specify a root or a URL that allows us to access the view. To do that, we need to make a new file. So we're going to make a file inside of our API app called urls.py. Now there's a two step kind of routing system here. What will happen is inside of my site, in the urls.py file. So I know it's a little bit difficult to see. Let's close that. If you go into my site and urls.py, you can see that we actually have the ability to forward URLs to different apps. The way this works is we will always start by looking in this file and we'll look for a specific pattern and then we'll take the remainder after that pattern and forward it over to a different app. In this case, if we go to admin, so we go to the URL of our server and then admin, it's going to take whatever comes after the slash here and it's going to forward it over to the admin.site.urls to parse the rest of the request. In our case, what we want to do is we want to take any URL, so anything that they type in, and we want to forward that over to our API app. The reason why we have this file here is you might have different apps and they may all have different prefixes and then have similar types of URLs. You'll see what I mean in a second, but for now we can actually remove the import from admin because we don't need that. And we can change what's here to say path and just be an empty path. And then we're going to write a function called include and we're going to include the api.urls and we're going to import the include function. Now, what we're saying here is whenever we receive any type of URL, it doesn't matter what it starts with, what it ends with, doesn't matter. We're going to take it and we're simply going to pass it over to the api.urls file where it will then be parsed from there. Keep in mind that if you wanted to, you could do something like API slash. And now if we want to access a URL that we write inside of our API app to get there, we would do something like the server URL slash API slash and then whatever the root is for our different views. Again, I know it's a little bit confusing, but you'll see what I mean when we write the URLs in our API. So now we have the URLs being forwarded over to that app. So let's just make this an empty string again. Let's go over to urls.py now and let's write these different URLs and connect them with the views that we just made. The view is the root. It's what's going to be rendered onto the screen or what will return data. And the URL is how we get there. So we're going to say from Django dot URLs, import path, and we're going to say from dot import views. The dot just means the current directory or the current package in this case. So we're going to do that and import the views file where we'll then be able to access the view that we wrote. We're then simply going to say the URL patterns is equal to an array. And inside of here, we're going to make a new path. And the path we're going to have is blog posts and then slash and make sure you have this trailing slash. Now what we're going to do is we're going to say views dot the blog post list create dot as underscore view. And we're simply going to give this a name and we're going to say this is the blog post view 
create view. Now I know it's a little bit long, but let's zoom out here so you can read all of it. What we're doing, importing the path from the Django URLs. We're importing the views, and then what we're using is something known as a class-based view. That's what we've created here. This is a generic view. And the way that we render it is we say views dot, whatever the name of the class is, dot as view. This pretty much means anytime we go to the blog post route here, we're gonna be brought to this page where we can then interact with the API. Now keep in mind, we're gonna do this from the browser, but you can do this from Postman, you can do this from a different server. You don't have to do this graphically, it's just nice to be able to view it graphically as we go through the tutorial. So we were actually just about to run the server, but before we do that, there's actually one step that we need to do, which is migrating our database. Now we'll talk about that step, but first of all, I'd just like you to go into the models.py file and notice that we have this auto add now. It actually needs to be auto now add, I just had, or I just found that story while I was looking at it. So let's just fix that small mistake there that I had inside of the published date. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring up the terminal and we're gonna apply a database migration. Now, anytime you create a new model or you make any changes to your models, what you'll do is you'll make a new migration and you'll apply it. And what that's gonna do is use the Django ORM to automatically create the correct SQL tables or do whatever it needs to do essentially in the database for this to work properly. So the way we do that is we make sure we're inside of our my site directory and we type python3 manage.py and then we're going to say make migrations. Now make migrations is going to create the files that will specify what migrations need to be applied. In this case you can see we're going to create a model blog post. Now we need to actually apply the migrations and to apply the migrations we simply type the command migrate. So python3 manage.py make migrations wait for that to finish, then python3 manage.py migrate. When we do that, we'll see that this is actually applied and we've now created the tables in our SQL database, which is called db.sqlite3. Now we can clear and we can type the command python manage.py and then run server. And when we do that, it will start running our Python API. So let's go ahead and do that. We shouldn't get any errors here. Again, make sure you fix this. So it says auto now add, and you will see that we have this URL, which is where our API is being ran. So what we can do now is simply go to this in our browser. So I'm gonna control click it. It's gonna show me an error right away. Don't freak out. The reason for this is because we need to go to the blog post URL. So we're gonna go slash blog posts. And we, when we do that, we'll see our API view. Now inside of here, we can create a new blog post. To do that, we can do something like title and then test content, and we can click on post. And now you'll see a new blog post is created. We have the option to call get. When we call get, it gives us an array that contains all of these. Now in this case, we get a nice graphical view showing us how the API works, but of course you can use this from something like Postman, curl, the command line, doesn't matter. You just need to call the API correctly with the correct headers and the correct field names in this case, the field names will be title and content. Those are the two required ones to create a new blog post. Okay, so that is that route, but I now want to shut down the server and I wanna show you how we create some other routes that allow us to do some more specific things. So first of all, let's go into the views.py file. And I wanna mention that you may have noticed we didn't actually have the ability to delete any of the blog posts that we had. Now we can make it so that we can delete all of the blog posts in a single route. The way we can do that is by adding a route here to this API view because we can actually override the de default view, sorry, or we can actually create a new route that allows us to delete individual blog posts. So let's do that first and then I'll show you the override. What I'm gonna do is create a new class here and this is gonna be the blog post and then the retrieve, if I spelled that correctly, update, and destroy view. Now inside of here, this is gonna be generics dot, and this is the retrieve destroy API view, or actually, sorry, retrieve update destroy API view. I know it's a little bit long, so let's make this a bit easier to see. And inside of here, we're gonna specify the same thing that we did before. So we're gonna copy the query set and the serializer class. We're gonna paste that inside of here. And we're gonna have the lookup underscore field be equal to PK, which stands for primary key, which in this case is gonna be the ID of our uh, blog post. Now, all this is doing is giving us another generic view. This will allow us to access an individual um, post, and then we can update that post and delete that post. So that's it for the view. Now what we'll do is we'll go over to our URLs and we'll make a URL to map to that view. Hopefully you're kind of getting the process by now. 
So we're gonna put a comma here. We're gonna make a new path. And this path is gonna be blog posts slash. And then in this case, we're actually gonna take a path parameter. To do that, we're gonna say int colon, and then this is going to be PK, which stands for primary key. We're then gonna have another slash. Then we're gonna say views dot the blog post. And this is the retrieve update destroy view. And we're gonna say as underscore view like that. And then we're gonna give this a name and we can just say updates. I'm just giving it a short name for now because I don't wanna write out the whole thing. Okay, so what we've done here is specified, hey, we're gonna have the same route with blog posts, but this time if you pass as a part of that path, the ID of the object you want to retrieve, what you can do is you can update, delete it, retrieve it. That's it. So now what we'll do is we'll go here and rerun our server. We'll open it up again. So let me bring it over here. And if I go over to slash one, uh, sorry, slash blog posts slash one, we'll see that we access the blog post with ID one, which is the following one here. So I could say test content, update this and then put, and then if I want, I can delete this by clicking on the delete button. And now if we go back and we view all of the blog posts, you'll see that we don't have any because we deleted them. Okay, so that's almost all that I wanted to show you. Last thing I will quickly run you through, run you through here, sorry, before we get into the deployment is how we override some of our views. So if we go to views.py, you'll notice that inside of here, what we can actually do is override any HTTP method if we wanted to make this slightly more custom. So in this case, we're just using the generic views from Django because they're quite good and they're quite useful. However, we can override them. So what I could do is I could say define delete inside of here. Now for delete, I need to take in self request star args and star star quargs like that. I then will say blog post dot objects dot all. And then I can say something like dot delete. And then I can return a response, which we're going to have to import in a second. And we're going to say the status is equal to status dot HTTP underscore 204 underscore no underscore content like that. And now what we'll do is simply import from the rest framework. Uh, actually, yes, from the rest framework, we'll import status. And then we'll say from the rest framework dot response import response. And now what we've done is we've just written our own route. And what this will do is add a delete route now to this API view. And what will happen is it will just delete all of the different blog posts that exist and then return a response, which is HTTP 204 no content, uh, which is what we're supposed to return when we delete something. So just to quickly show that to you so you can see how easy this is and how it works. Now, if I load up my server and I go to the page slash blog posts, okay you'll see that now a delete button exists. And if we click that delete button, it will actually just delete all of the blog posts that we have because that's the custom logic that we wrote here. We just deleted all of the blog posts. So to wrap up writing our views, I'll show you creating a custom API view because this can be somewhat useful. So I'm gonna say from the rest framework dot views import the API view. And I'm just gonna paste in a view here that you can reference if you wanna do this. So let's say we wanna make our own routes where we don't wanna use the generic ones. Well, what we can do is inherit from the general API view. And then what we can do is write different methods based on the name of the method we want to implement. So in this case, get, but we could write post, delete, put, patch, etc., and they'll automatically be added for us to whatever the route is that we write. Now, in this case, this is simulating getting all of the blog posts that have a matching title. So what I've done is I've said, okay, well, maybe I'm gonna have a query parameter here called title. What I'll do is check if the title exists. If it does, and I wanna find any of the blog posts that have that information contained in their title, then if I don't have a title, I'll get all of the blog posts. I'll manually serialize them by using the blog post serializer, which I can do using this. And then I'll return a response that contains the data provided from the serializer with a status of HTTP 200 OK. Now, if I wanted to connect this with the URLs, same thing, I would just have whatever the name of this is, dot as view, and then that'd be it. I just simply have written a simple API view here that allows me to query based on the name of a object. All right, so that's gonna wrap up the coding phase of this video. The next thing that I wanna show you how to do is actually deploy this API so you can share it with other people and you can get it running on a public endpoint. Because currently we have this simply running on localhost, 
on our port 8000, but instead we might wanna run this on a public URL so it's a bit more flexible, other people can use it, and we can actually test it in a production environment. So to do that, bear with me, I'm gonna run you through the steps. Now for the deployment here, we're gonna use something known as Acorn. Acorn is free, you do not need to pay to use it, and I have teamed up with them for this video. Now what Acorn allows us to do is create something known as an Acorn file. Now this Acorn file will specify our entire application and pretty much describe how it should be deployed. We can then use this Acorn file to build an Acorn image, somewhat similar to something like a Docker image. We can then publish that image and we can use it to deploy as many instances of our application as we like. Now this is great because it allows us to actually deploy this out quite quickly, but it also allows us to share our application with other people by giving them the Acorn image. You're gonna see what I mean, and I made an entire video about this if you want some more details. So I'll link that here by putting it on the screen and leaving a link to it in the description. Now, the first thing we need to do here is actually create a Docker file, which specifies how we run our application. And then the Acorn file will specify all of the services and the additional configuration we need when we actually wanna deploy this out. So we're gonna make a new file inside of my site called Docker file. Now I'm gonna paste in the contents of this file and you can copy it from the links in the description. All of this code will be available on GitHub. It just doesn't make sense for me to write all of this out because it's fairly long. So let's quickly go through what this file actually looks like. We start by specifying the syntax for the Docker file. We specify the image we wanna build this from. Then we have that we're exposing port 8000 because that's where our server will be running. We specify the working directory. We install some system dependencies. We copy the requirements.txt file, which means we actually need to take this file and we need to put it inside of the my site directory. So make sure it's inside of there. We then use the pip command to install all of the requirements. We copy all of the contents of this directory. We specify the entry point, which is using Python 3, and then the command that we want to run to run our server, which is Python 3, manage.py, run server. And then we just specify we want to run it on all the public endpoints. So the Docker file is pretty straightforward. It's just explaining how we actually run the application. Now, the thing that we're missing, though, is all of the instructions for deploying the application. We know how to run it. But when we want to deploy an app, we need to do things like set up the database. We may need to do some database migrations. There's some other steps, and that's where the Acorn file comes in. Now, before I write that Acorn file, I'm just going to create a new file inside of my site, and this is going to be db-script.sh. Now, this is going to be a simple script that we're going to use whenever we start running our application so that we migrate the database and ensure that everything is set up. So I'm just going to paste this in here. Again, you can copy it from the link in the description. We're running the Python 3 manage.py make migrations, and then we're migrating just so that if we make any changes to the database, that'll automatically be applied. And when we do a new deployment, the database that we're connecting to will have those tables created. So this is a script that will run, and I'll show you how we'll end up running that. Okay, so now we have our Docker file, we have our database script, and we're gonna go outside of this core directory here, and we're gonna make a new file, and we're gonna call this the acorn file, like this. Now, for the acorn file to be a little bit more useful to us, we're gonna go into the extensions here in VS Code, and we're gonna install the acorn extension. It just gives us some syntax highlighting for this acorn file, so go ahead and do that. And now I'm gonna paste in the acorn file and quickly walk you through it. Now this can seem a little bit overwhelming, but I promise you that if you read through the documentation, it's not overly complex. And there is all kinds of examples in the Acorn docs for creating your own Acorn files. This is just one for Django. Okay, so what are we doing here? Well, inside of the Acorn file, we're essentially specifying everything we need to be able to deploy this application. So we have some services, we have some jobs, we have the containers that we need to run, and we have the images that we're using. So we start with some arguments, and the one argument that we need is the Django database name, which is what we'll use when we actually create the database with whatever database server service sorry, we choose to use. So we're calling this Django DB. We then have a service we're going to use. Now for our Django app, we need to have a database. This database can be many different types. It could be Postgres, it could be MongoDB. In this case, we're going to use the MariaDB or MariahDB, whatever you want to call this. What we do is just specify that for this database, we are going to have the argument of Django database name, which is simply Django DB. And we're using this image to essentially create a database for us. So that's a service that's gonna be a part of our deployed application. We then have a job. Now what the job will do is initialize the database for us. So we've called this DB init. We're going to build images.app.container build, which we specify down here. So don't worry about that. 
we have an environment. Inside of the environment, we're using some environment variables or we're actually creating environment variables that come from this service. So whenever we connect to a database, well, we need a username, password, address, port, and database name. So we're just specifying what all of these are as accessible variable names that we can use within our code, which we'll actually do in just a second. We're consuming the database. We have an entry point. We're using this script, the bin bash. And then the command that we want to run is this. What this does is make our database script file executable, and then it executes the database script file so that we actually go and apply the migrations to our new database that we're connecting to. We then have a container. This is the container that runs our application. The job is what runs beforehand to set everything up. Then what we do is we build the image that we specified down here, which is inside of our Docker file. This describes how to run the application. We make sure we publish HTTP on port 8000. We make sure we depend on this job. So this job needs to finish before we start running this container. And then we consume the database service that we specified up here. We have some arguments for being in dev mode, like the directories that we're going to be using. And then again, we specify the variables that we need in our environment for this application to run properly. Down here, we just specify the container, so where they're located, essentially, where the Docker file is. I know it seems a bit complicated, but trust me, if you've ever worked with Docker before or you start doing deployment, you'll see how easy this is to actually write out. Okay, so now that we have the Acorn file, there's just a few last adjustments we need to make, and then I'm going to show you how we run it. So from my site, we're gonna go into requirements.txt and we're just gonna add a package that we need when we start working with a MySQL database. We're gonna say MySQL clients like this, which will allow us to work with the Mariah or Maria DB. Okay, now that we have that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into my site. We're gonna to go to settings.py and we're gonna make a few adjustments to allow this to actually be deployed because right now this is just for development on our local machine and we just need to adjust a few things so it works in a deployed environment. So first of all, we're going to go to allowed hosts and we're just going to add an exclamation or sorry, an asterisk here, which lets us run this on any host. The reason we want that is so that we're able to run this on the acorn host, which you're going to see in a second. We're now going to make a variable here, which is CSRF underscore. And this is going to be trusted underscore origins. And this is going to store the trusted origins for when we submit our forms. So we're going to have HTTP colon slash slash. Then this is going to be asterisk uh, dot on dash acorn like that dot IO. We're then going to copy this and we are going to paste it and just change this to HTTPS. Now we just need this so that when we're submitting the forms from the API site, we don't get any CSRF issues. So we're just allowing all of the acorn origins because that's where we're deploying it to. Last thing we need to do is we need to import OS from the top here so we can access some environment variables. And we're going to change our database configuration here so that we end up using the database that is created for us by the Acorn file for our deployment. So what we'll do is we'll go down to databases and I'm just going to copy this in. Again, you can copy it from the link in the description. We're going to change default to be equal to this. Now, what we've done is we've specified that the engine we want to use is the backends.mysql engine. This is different than the SQLite 3 engine we were using before. We then want to connect to the MariaDB database. So we have the name, user, password, host, and port, which all come from the environment variables, which are specified inside of the Acorn file. So basic idea is Acorn file will spin up a database for us, and then we want to make sure we use the environment variables that allow us to connect to that specific database. So that's why we need to modify that inside of our Python API or our Django API. Okay, that's all of the setup required. Now that we have that finished, what we need to do is simply run the Acorn file or run the Acorn image or build the Acorn image, whatever you wanna call it. Now, in order to do that, we first need to install the Acorn CLI, which is pretty straightforward. Let me get the command for you. All right, so I just have this page open, which shows you how to install the Acorn CLI. You can go to docs.acorn.io slash install. We can brew install this if we're on Mac or Linux, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to copy that command, or you can use scoop. This is a tool that you need to install on Windows. Okay, so I'm just going to go into my command prompt here, and I'm going to paste in this command. I already have Acorn installed, so this should be fairly fast. And for you guys, it should install the Acorn CLI. Now we simply run the command Acorn login. When we do that, it will log us into our Acorn account. Again, you can just use GitHub to do this. It's completely free. And once we're logged in, which I already am, what we can do is run our Acorn file. Now to do that, we're going to CD into the root directory here. So notice we have our Acorn file and then we have my site. And now what we're going to do is simply type Acorn dev 
and then dot. Now, when I do that, it's gonna start running the Acorn image for me, and it will actually give us a deployed version of our app, and then I'll show you how we can share this. So let's hit enter. We're gonna give this a second to spin up. You're gonna see that it creates a database for us. It gets a public URL, it exposes the port, it just runs through everything, which is really, really nice. And then we can access the deployed URL, which you'll see in a minute. All right, so you can see now that it actually ends up giving us an endpoint because this was deployed successfully. So I can click on this open it up and now you'll see that we have our API. And if I go here to slash blog posts, we're able to view the API view, but now this time it's on a publicly deployed HTTPS URL endpoint, which could be quite useful, especially in deployment. Now, the way that I ran this is using something known as dev mode. Dev mode will give you some file synchronization and it just really quickly spins this up for you so you can start using it and you don't have to actually go to the Acorn website. However, what I wanna show you now is how you would actually share this with someone else. So what you can do is simply create an Acorn image, you can publish that image, and then you can just give someone the URL to that image. And now they can create the same instance of your application pretty much instantly. They can mess around with it, they can break it, they can change it, and it doesn't affect your deployment because every time you deploy the Acorn image, you get a new deployment, which is quite cool. So let me show that to you and then we'll explain more about how it works. All right, so I just shut this down by hitting Control C and now we're just gonna run a command that allows us to actually kind of tag this image and upload it to a registry so other people can use it and you can share it. Now to do this, we first need to log into a registry. Now the one most of us are familiar with is the Docker one, so that's what we're gonna sign into. We're gonna say Acorn, login, and then index.docker.io. Now I'm already signed in, but in your case, just sign into it. And this allows you now to have a place where you can publish your different images. There's a bunch of other registries as well, uh, but this is one that I'm sure most of you are probably gonna wanna use. Now, what we're gonna do is simply build the image. So we're gonna say acorn build dash T, which stands for the tag name. And then we're gonna do the name of the registry, which is index.docker.io slash, this is gonna be your username on the registry. In this case, mine is tech with Tim zero. And then you're gonna give the name to your image. So I'm gonna say Django tutorial YouTube like that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and run that. It's gonna build an acorn image for us. Once the acorn image is built, we can then push it to the registry and we can really easily share it with other people. All right, so this has been built. Now that it's built, what I wanna do is push this. So I'm just gonna change the command so that rather than having acorn build, we simply say acorn push, and then it's just the same name of the image we just created. When I do that, it will push it to the registry. And then we can simply take this name and we can create a URL that allows other people to deploy this image. Really, really cool. It's just like a Docker image, except in this case, it specifies the entire deployment of the application, which makes it really easy to share and deploy without interfering with your actual code. So you can see that this finished. So I'm just gonna copy the name of what it is that we deployed there, or what we pushed, sorry. And now we can simply go to the Acorn website. So let me just load this up here. So I just simply went to acorn.io and then I pressed login. It brought me into my dashboard here. And what I can do is click on my username. I can click on shared acorns. And then you can see that it shows me actually all of the stats for different acorns that I have shared. What I'm gonna do is just paste in the image, which is this, and notice it gives me a link that I can share with people. So now I can copy that link. This will actually be what's in the description, by the way. And now you can simply paste that link into your browser. When you do that, it's gonna bring you to the Acorn platform. It's gonna show you the Acorn image so we can view the source file of the Acorn file if we want. We can pick where we wanna deploy it to, so what project or what folder. We can just press on deploy and it's gonna deploy a new instance for us. So this is exactly what you guys will be able to do whatever you just saw pretty much in my terminal is gonna happen exactly for you in your own Acorn account. And you're gonna get a running instance here that allows you to mess around with it. Now it's worth noting that these are not gonna be deployed persistently. They are going to be in kind of a container that will die after a few hours. You can extend that time and you can still use Acorn to deploy persistently, but it's a little bit of a different process and not something that I'm gonna get into in this video. All right, so the Acorn is finished provisioning here and you can see that it is running. What I can do now is I can simply click on this button and it's gonna bring me now to a URL. This is different than the one that we had before where this is deployed. Now, same thing, 
I can go to slash blog post. I now have a new instance of the API here that I can mess around with and do whatever I want with. So there you go. That's pretty much it for deploying with Acorn. I think this is really cool, especially because in a development environment, it makes it really easy to share this with other people. I now don't need to spin up a virtual private server. I don't need to go do all this Linux config. I just write a Docker file like I normally would. I write an Acorn file. I now have the entire deployment of the application described. I can just send this to my boss. I can send this to a coworker and they can spin up their own version. They can have it alive for as long as they want. They can mess with it. They can break it and it doesn't affect me. And I don't have to constantly change things around or fix things that they're breaking. Anyways, guys, that's going to wrap up this video. As a reminder, all of this code will be available from the link in the description. If you want to deploy your own version of this API, you can click the acorn link that I have below. And I look forward to seeing you in another video. Thank you.